Hello and welcome to Strange Stuff. My name is Andy. And uh, I'm Mark. was lunch it was actually quite funny and there was a lot of filthy talking of course really well that's what happens when i'm not there to moderate the conversation <laughs> but yeah it's all right. good so you're feeling uh, fully nourished and uh, ready for action well i don't know about that you've sort of left me with no time to prepare aha uh-huh. yes uh, cancelling really nearly notice. two hours before recording <laughs> no, you're like right. a fucking diva I'm not it wasn't. Doing it. it wasn't two hours before. <laughs> it was a day before. No, it was on the Thursday. Yeah, Thursday at six o'clock in the morning. I think I sent you a message. Well, that's still the Thursday. We recorded. Yeah, but on it's Thursday. not two hours before, is it? Well, it's not a day before either. No, you're right. <laughs> no, you're right. Well, I didn't even know I was going down. No, but I mean, luckily, because of the amount of preparation that goes into this, it doesn't really <laughs> it doesn't matter really if matter. we do it. No at nine o'clock on a notice. Sunday morning, it will still yeah. sound exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. Have you at least got some subject we can talk about? Well, I've been mulling over that, and I, the one that I've actually landed on, yes. um, when I first read it, I thought, well, it's a nice little story, but it's not really that strange. But then I thought more about it, and I thought, bearing in mind it takes place in, like, 1880, yes. the tenacity, the sheer bullheadedness of the guy who is the protagonist yes. <laughs> is yes. worthy of a story all by itself. Good. Like, Go he, for he's, it. he's just brilliant. I found this story on a, a site called coolinterestingstuff.com just yes. for the purpose of reference. Yes. And uh, it's concerning a clergyman, a, a guy called Dr. Oh, no. Morgan Dix, who was. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, D I X. Don't worry. He was one of America's most active and respected churchmen. Uh, for over 50 years, he was associated with the New York's Trinity Church, first as a minister and then as a rector. Uh, He's also responsible for writing a number of religious works. And he was apparently a genuinely godly man, very kindly and very tolerant. Okay, so that's the good stuff. That's 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 your base. Sorry, day 18, what, 1890 or something? 1880. 1880, right. Okay, so it's some time ago. In fact, we start on the morning of February the 18th, 1880. In the morning, uh, when the rector, or when the Reverend Dix answered the doorbell, at his rectory, and standing outside was a respectable-looking young man in clerical garb uh, who presented himself as the head of an academy for young ladies. And he was there in response to Dix's letter asking them to take three little girls into their establishment. Now, Dix politely explained that there was some kind of strange mistake. but never sent such a letter. (laughs) And for that matter, he didn't have three little girls who needed to be placed in a school. So the man went on his way, and Dix brooded over the matter for a moment and then returned to his breakfast. It was a breakfast he was fated to leave unfinished. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, dear. In fact, he wouldn't have a peaceful meal again for quite some time. Scarcely had he sat down when another representative from another girls' school arrived. He'd gotten a similar letter, purportedly from the Reverend Dix, asking if he had space for three little girls and would they come and collect them. Right. Now, by the time the day was over, about 20 such gentlemen had turned up on Dix's door. That is, they turned up when Dix's door wasn't already being besieged by emissaries from Bible societies, publishing houses and merchants of all varieties. Each and every one of them, clutching letters, signed with Dix's name, saying he wished to make large purchases from them for various charitable organisations. Then came the safe manufacturers, the wig makers the horse dealers, dancing instructors, <laughs> all of them believing that the Reverend had requested their services. Right. Now, 
Bearing in mind, this is February 1880. There was no such thing as a printer and a word no. processor. Someone no. has handwritten letters yeah. and gone yeah. to great trouble and expense to organise this massive sure game are. of knockdown ginger. Yes. Can, this is why I thought... I can't these, imagine what this father dicks had done to someone to annoy them to the extent that they'd go to that, it, you know, those lengths to write multiple letters. Well, I mean... They, they also, they, at least they were... It wasn't like 400 pizza delivery. Well, yeah, but, you know, Uber Eats <laughs> wasn't invented. Invented <laughs> in those days. No, you're okay. right. You're right. To Dix's increasing horror, on the following day, he was confronted by a similar parade of callers, augmented by a flood of puzzled letters from clergymen across the entire East Coast, responding to notes that they'd received from Dix, chiding them for not answering his letters to them. Letters, of course, which had never been written. Some of these letters, we are told, not so tactfully suggested that Dix had been working too hard and needed a good long rest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On February 21st, this is three days later, Dix received an unsigned letter informing him that a writer had arranged for some dealers in used clothing to come by that day and pick up Mrs. Dix's entire wardrobe. Sure enough, soon after reading this letter, Dix saw a parade of these merchants arriving, driving their wagons up to his house, loudly demanding the clothing they'd been promised. Dix barricaded himself inside his home, but the dealers, increasingly angry, at how, in their eyes, the rector was trying to swindle them, caused such a riot that police had to be called and drive them away. No sooner had these outraged clothiers departed than a carriage came racing up to the rectory. It stopped, and a doctor leapt out, ran inside the house. He was quite indignant when he learned that, contrary to what the urgent message had told him, the Reverend was not dying of an epileptic fit. He was soon joined by about 30 other physicians... <laughs> all of whom had received the same frantic plea for medical assistance. Um, and it wasn't dude. until midnight that Dix was finally rid of the lot of them. Now, at this stage, there must have been over a 100 handwritten letters signed, I mean, yeah. sealed and delivered, probably by hand by the young street urchin who was run off his feet all over the city. I, I don't know if there was much of a postal service in 1880. Of I course. guess there was. Of course there was. Probably, well, how many penny blacks had been used in the service of this hoax? Probably not too many in America, because Penny Blacks came from the UK, didn't they? Well spotted. Well <laughs> spotted. No, but what would they had that mail line, the stagecoach mail line, whatever it was called. They had the Pony Express. Uh, thank you, the Pony Express. Uh, yes. How, how, I wonder if this fellow was a Catholic priest. I suppose he probably would have been Probably in New York, not. He would have been Protestant, I would have thought. In New York? Yeah. Oh, no, Irish there's a lot immigrants. of Irish immigrants, yeah. Irish immigrants and Catholics. Well, and, yeah, uh, but 50-50... And Italians. 50-50 Catholics and Protestants, so the Irish. That's uh, what the Troubles no. are all about. Mm, well, of course I understand that, but, well, you're right. Uh, I don't know if they came from mainland, I mean, the, the country of Ireland or Northern Ireland, I don't know. But anyway, whatever. We can. It doesn't matter whether he was Catholic or Protestant. It's the same Obviously degree Obviously to of... you it does. You're obviously a bigot of some kind. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Not at all. It, what is it? Americans and Catholics. Yes. <laughs> Well, Catholics, I have a reason, because I was brought up a Catholic. Well, so was I. I wasn't brought up an American. I was dragged up a Catholic. Well, you actually went to a Catholic school? Uh, yes. Chapel every day? No, it wasn't uh, It wasn't a, a sexually abusive school. <laughs> At least they left <laughs> me alone, I wasn't luckily. <laughs> yeah. I thought, what was wrong with me? Everyone else is getting a bit... <laughs> Yeah, we were forced so this, to go to church and all that nonsense. Well, I'm not surprised if it was a proper Catholic school. Oh, but it, was it run by uh, monks or no, sisters? No, luckily. I mean, my older brother, because he was... We went to whichever school he went to, if you see what I mean. Where he yes. went, we had to follow. Yes. And he applied, when we left our junior schools at age 11, he applied to go to a school, I think it was Aloysius. Yeah, Sister Aloysius. I, I had one of those. And that was run by monks, and they had a fearsome reputation. Yeah. You knew people who'd been there, and they all they could talk about was the punishments meted out by these sadistic, perverted motherfuckers who ran the school in the name of oh. God. Oh. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I was quite pleased when they turned Cat. down. Oh, it's one of mine. 
I was quite pleased when they turned down his application because we lived just outside their catchment area. Uh, so he applied to a couple of other schools, but he got a letter all of a sudden from a school that he hadn't applied to, uh, Sir William of York in Islington, uh, saying that he'd been accepted and was offered a place. So There's that's a bit of a he parallel went. here between Father Dix and your brother in that case. Unsolicited responses yes. to letters that were never sent. Yes. So Lucky that, for that's him, where we William ended up of going. York. And did it do him proud? Well, it did all of us proud, except... <laughs> do you mean it didn't do you very proud? <laughs> well, he, I mean, he, he certainly uh, achieved all his O and A levels that he aimed for. All right, OK, good. Uh, he was definitely the most studious of the bunch. Well, unlike myself. In fact, we've established that you're actually better academically qualified than I am, which isn't difficult, <laughs> having, having left school with four passing grade O levels. Yeah, but when I left school, I went straight to work down the pit. You went straight to work in the office of Daddy's factory. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you were second in charge. <laughs> Not quite. Not quite, Andy. But I know what you had for your packed lunch on the first day. It's Nanny's homemade marmalade on toast. <laughs> I'm surprised you know what button to press, bearing in mind you've only done it twice. That's pretty good. Oh anyway, sorry, now back to Father Dix. Well, yes. So he's had this avalanche of sellers and doctors, um, and now people are suggesting he uh, takes a holiday. Dance instructors, Yes. So anyway, perhaps some of the doctors should have stuck around. Because... because bright and early in the next morning, Dix was awakened by half a dozen shoemakers... <laughs> who'd been summoned to measure the rectory's residence for footwear. The reverend probably was close to having fits <laughs> at this stage. God. Dick spent his lunchtime dealing with 50 or so people answering help-wanted ads placed in his name, and dinner time saw him eyeing 20 of New York's most important clergymen who had, who had answered his invitation to come and dine with him in order to meet <laughs> the bishops of York and Exeter. <laughs> Oh dear. Now the it wasn't this Arthur Ferguson fellow who was trying to sell Nelson's column a few weeks ago. This wasn't his first scam when no, he went to America, this, this, was he? No, because this isn't a scam. There's no there's no monetary gain for anybody here. In fact, it's costing the the, the protagonist money to send out all these letters. Yeah, but it must be pretty satisfying to have caused this level of irritation on the part of uh, Father Dix. I would imagine that the cost of the quills alone must have run into the pennies. Quills. They had <laughs> biros in 1880. They did not. <laughs> <laughs> they had pencils and uh, chalk. But did they have any lead in their pencil? <laughs> More than they do these days. 50% fall since 1970. Someone's what? screaming. That's where cat's screaming. Oh. Okay, so the following morning, yes. it was enlivened by visits from officials of some of the city's top business houses. And they'd all received letters signed with Dix's name, threatening legal action because of the insulting communications that the Reverend had received from them. These emissaries had no idea what this was all about. They hadn't, of course, sent Dix any letters at all, but they were nevertheless anxious to assure the Reverend of their, good, of their goodwill. In the meantime, word had spread about the lively doings at the Trinity Rectory, and crowds of New Yorkers with no <laughs> Netflix... <laughs> <laughs> and nothing better to do. Nothing better to do. <laughs> ...were now surrounding the Reverend's home, happily waiting to see who would show up at his door next. It was a party atmosphere for everyone except the Dix family. Uh, was he married? Yeah, I mean, in those days, there was no such thing as uh, celibacy. Don't be ridiculous. They, uh, no, there might have been celibacy as part of the rules, but nobody took any notice of it. I'm telling you that Catholic priests in 1880 weren't allowed to have families and wives. So now we've established... Is that why they did the church Protestant. choir, boys? Probably, pretty much so. Right, so he's Protestant. It may be important come the conclusion of this story. Well, the conclusion will have to wait, in fact, because it's time for this. And now, a word from our sponsors. It feels strangely empty without Smooth My Balls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm surprised we weren't contacted by a female equivalent. <laughs> oh, yes. Bearing in mind it was simply a continuation of 
what you were saying before, this long litany or chronologically listed litany of passers-by dropping in this. So it was businessmen was the last thing. Yes, and it and was, and the party atmosphere outside the rectory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we got that bit. And it wasn't until the end of that day that the understandably befuddled Reverend got any clue about how and why his life had been turned into a nightmare. Uh, he received a letter from someone who gave his name only as Gentleman Joe. Right. Joe cheerfully informed Dix that this persecution would only end when the rector paid him $1,000. A quick today's money value of a thousand dollars in eighteen eighty. I'd say a million. No. Okay, you check it out. I bet you're yeah. close. Yeah, I'll Google that. Go for it. Carry on. If Dix agreed, he was to place an ad in the New York Herald saying, "Gentleman Joe, all right." Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so far, it's a cunning plan. Yes. And then what happened? Well, Dix naturally took this letter straight to the police. Uh -huh. After scratching their heads a bit, even for New York, this was a novel bit of weirdness. They told the Reverend to follow the ungentlemanly Joe's instructions. Right, yes. Dix did so, but was baffled to find that when the ad was published, the newspaper contained two other identical ads, evidently placed by Joe himself. Saying? Gentleman Joe, all right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, by this point, and quite bored, Joe was with the Reverend Dix. Yes. He ignored the Reverend's ad, uh, ad and instead turned his unwelcome attentions to a crowd of other New York religious leaders, all of whom received abusive letters signed with the names of various saloon owners demanding they settle their extensive bills for liquor. <laughs> God damn. It sounds ridiculous that it, something could have been orchestrated in such a way. It's genius. I mean, this is a guy you want working for your company. Absolutely. This is an organisational genius. Yeah, absolutely. This is a guy who could run Amazon, Uber Eats and Uber Cabs. Yeah, you're right. Go for it. Carry on. Anyway, Dix was left in an uneasy peace until March the 17th, which is, I think, St. Patrick's Day. Could be. When he received another letter from Joe. This one warned that unless Dick sent him fifteen hundred dollars on the following okay. Friday, did he pay the? He did pay the first lot. No, 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 he didn't. He just put the ad in the newspaper, oh, agreeing right. yeah, to yeah. it. Okay, yep, 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 yep. But this one warned that unless he sent him fifteen hundred bucks on the following Friday, the rectory yes. would see a sequel to the previous adventures. Ah, uh -huh, okay, yes, yeah. When Friday rolled around, police surrounded the house, and Dix locked himself in his office. But Joe was too much for them. First, a lawyer arrived at the house. He had received a letter, supposedly signed by Mrs. Dix, stating she wanted a divorce. <laughs> by this time, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yes, but he wasn't alone. Twenty yeah. other attorneys, who had all received identical letters, soon followed. Then came an agent from a steamship line with tickets to Havana that Dix had ordered. I would have got on it if I was him. They were closely followed by a crowd of people who had advertised for lost or stolen property that Dix had found. <laughs> I hope we get a conclusion to this story. They had received letters informing them that their goods could be retrieved at the rectory. Over the next few days, the stream of people continued, all of them answering various summonses. The dramatic climax came when an angry man pushed his way into the rectory accused Dix of trying to seduce his wife and threatened him with a beating unless the Reverend made a public apology for his disgraceful conduct. <laughs> Did he? Well, the day after this encounter, Dix received another letter from Joe, gleefully saying how much he had enjoyed his visit with the Reverend. Even I'm getting confused now. It was Gentleman Joe who Joe, turned up uh, at the right, rectory. Okay, okay yeah. Got it, got it. To see his handiwork firsthand. And so obviously the priest didn't recognise this fellow. It wasn't one of his parishioners. No, who it was obviously a stranger to, to him. It was just a, a random mischief maker. Yeah, the police weren't, weren't having much luck tracking down Gentleman Joe because where do you start looking in 1880? a letter writer could be anywhere yeah you're right well no it couldn't be anywhere because i wonder what the literacy rates in 1880 were 10 percent of the population were probably literate in those days so that narrowed it down and none of the police <laughs> <laughs> no you're right actually might have been a bit of a drawback you can read can you you're inspector material 
Anyway, Should I throw the number at you, by the way? Yeah, go on. You were nowhere near close. You were. Is it mu- 420,000 or something? No, no, it's nothing like it. I only went back to 1914 because that was the only page I could find on my uh, uh, little iPad. 26,000. No, no, I'm not even that. $1,000 in, in 1914 is worth 26,000 now. Dollars. Average inflation rate, 3.3%. Okay, roll that back 25 years. Yeah, but we've already gone back uh, 110 years. Okay, so another 20, 20, say another 20%. Go. So so, 30, so so maybe it's 35,000 or something, but it's not a million. It doesn't sound right. It, it doesn't sound right, actually. So, but I mean, if, you, if, you'd have rate... spent, if you'd have spent that $1,000 buying a house, which you could have easily oh, no, done. No, 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 but that's something completely different. Present value of money is simply related to to, um, inflation, how much the value of the currency has diminished over the period of the time. Hmm. Anyway, carry on. It's still a significant sum of money, though it's not astronomical. I mean, the thing is, this guy, in spite of being a gentleman and literate, if you were going to extort money from someone, why on earth would you des- decide to extort it from a priest? Well, the priests, could, the priests get been... money coming in every week from the congregation, especially in those days. People used to buy their way into heaven. I know, but they weren't well. You wouldn't associate a priest as a wealthy person, would you? No, Unless it was back in the 1300s, 1400s. Certainly access to cash. Maybe, maybe. I mean, the the catholic church is possibly the richest institution on the planet no you're right but then they'd get all his money in quarters and dimes i assume that's american so we've established the police don't have a clue yeah they'd never they'd never heard introduced himself to father dix they'd never heard of anyone called gentleman joe on the criminal world and although they set up a dragnet across across the city in hopes of capturing him at some mailbox or another their efforts were pretty much futile what finally broke the case was when another clergyman told them of a former Trinity Sunday School teacher who'd been expelled from the church oh. for taking a disquieting interest in the choir boys. Uh-huh. <laughs> so there was a bit of substance to the story. This ex-churchman had the appropriately melodramatic name of Eugene Edward Fairfax Williamson. Sounds like a bit of a toff. Someone once told me, a friend of mine once told me that... Um, it's a, a great sign of character for someone who is given an unfortunate name by their parents to actually keep it. Like Hillary for a bloke. Well, my friend, Saddam Buttfuck. <laughs> <laughs> he kept his name, did he? Kept his name. <laughs> and said it great, gave him great strength of character. Probably did. What's happened to your goldfish bowl? You've only got a half size glass today. Oh, yeah, I'm taking it easy today. <laughs> Not surprised. It's only three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, but Saturday's the only day I can have a drink. I suppose so. I can't drink on Sunday because I'm driving on Monday morning. You're right. You're right. I shouldn't criticise you. No, I mean, uh, you know, it's like you, you can come home, have a glass of wine with Elevenses. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the morning. You don't have a glass of wine. Oh, no, you have port, don't you? Morning coffee. You have a champagne breakfast, followed by a glass of port with tiffin. I'll tell you what, I didn't have a champagne breakfast this morning. I was trudging off to the railway station at six o'clock this morning. Ugh. Didn't, I mean, did, how did you get there? You must have driven. Where? To the railway station? Yeah. No, I walked. I walked it, from the hotel. Oh, did you stay at Mora Hotel? No, I'm talking, I'm in Gothenburg. Oh, I was okay, in Gothenburg yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Experiencing the delights of a real city where they actually have cocktail bars. Here we go, here's a quick question for you. Something to shock our American listeners, if there are any still out there. Mm-hmm. Cost of a bottle of beer. I'm talking about a 33 centiliter, you know, a small bottle of beer. Yep. Hotel bar. Uh, it happened to be gluten-free because, you know, my tongue is a bit sensitive. <laughs> How much do you think it was? A small in, bottle of in the beer. Gothenburg Hotel. In a Gothenburg Hotel. I would, I would go eighty kroner. Oh well, you you were absolutely spot on. I bought a bottle of gluten free beer, and my son had just a, a small draft beer, sixteen quid, twenty dollars. Fuck me! It's just <laughs> crazy. I even went back to the bar. I said, "Are you sure?" <laughs> Sixteen quid. 
he looked dumbfounded as if I'd just fallen off the moon. Well, you've, I mean, the thing is, up until that point, you probably had his respect for a travelling gentleman off the road. <laughs> yes, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Staying in a hotel in a foreign country and buying but, I mean, beer. Even, I mean, and then you query the price and he'd say he's got you pinned now as a cheap tourist from London. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Whatever. I thought that was crazy. Eight quid. Eighty quid. No, no, listen, you should go to a pub in Camden Town in London now. You can pay nine quid for a pint of beer. In Camden? Yes. Nine. What? I went to, and this isn't, I mean, this is years ago. This is about eight years ago when I went over with Hannah and uh, one of her friends. I went out for a beer with my brother and we went into a pub in Camden Town. Nine quid a pint. I nearly <laughs> myself. <laughs> That must have been some sort of minority interest, speciality group type, demographic target. Yeah, mugs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, here's That's a couple of mugs. I can't believe that. That's nonsense. How Nine much should we charge? Nine quid. You, you know, the average price now in London is, is about six quid a pint. What? Yes. We, we... Well, it was four pounds when I left. And at my yeah, pub, Mark, it was that was 15 years ago. Oh, I suppose so. Yeah. It really has been gentrified. Why did we get on to talking about beer? Because uh, you were mentioning the, the meagerness of my wine this afternoon. Oh, that's right. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Sorry, have we finished the story? That was a good one, Andy. No, we're not in. Not quite, <laughs> not quite there yet. We got so far as um, Saddam Buttfuck. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the, this ex-churchman, the police obtained from the post office card written by Williamson requesting that his mail be forwarded to the Hotel Windsor and the handwriting on the card was identical to the handwriting to the on Gentleman Joe's letters. Yeah. So detectives rushed on foot or pony to the Windsor only to learn that their deranged bird had flown to Baltimore. Uh, he was traced to a boarding house in that city where he was actually arrested. Newspapers described him, love newspapers in those days, newspapers described him as a small, balding, sickly looking man of about 40. Williamson... I know one of those. <laughs> yeah, except I'm <laughs> nearly 60. <laughs> Williamson readily admitted his culpability, explaining that he had nothing against the Reverend Dix, it was just a joke. Right. And the rector was only chosen as a target because his upstanding reputation made the prank all the sweeter. I really don't know why, why I did it, he sighed to a reporter from the New York Sun. I have a soft spot in that direction. It's a mania. When I get a pen in my hand, I have to write. Now, the rest of the tale is quite brief. Williamson was tried for attempted blackmail and forging a cheque which he had used to swindle a jewellery firm. He was found guilty and imprisoned in Sing Sing, where he died only a few months into his three-and-a-half-year jail sentence. Oh, well, that's a bit of a sad story for, obviously, of someone who's a bit sad. Well, I, I don't know that he was a bit sad. I think he probably had a great time. Yeah, but the thing is, how did he enjoy it? Unless he was stationed across the road, spectating all of these people knocking on the door and seeing the reaction of the Reverend, uh, would it give him that? much sense of satisfaction just sort of imagining the level of irritation i can see it can you Maybe. not can you not see the joy you can get from winding someone up to breaking well, point if, if it ever happens to me andy i'll know who to blame that's for sure <laughs> well, if i ever get know a string which direction of deliveries. To look in. it happens all the time these days though doesn't it people just well, it's so easy deliveries yeah exactly it is so easy unless you live in sweden well although as i told you i think i told you before hannah's had pizzas delivered here our uh, pizza yeah they don't yeah i'm talking about online shopping actually oh yeah but the problem with online shopping is you need a, a, a way to pay for it uh yes and in fact uh whenever i buy something online you need to uh, verify your identity it you depends know, with... on the purchase price some stuff is just simple one click is that right yeah it's not often i buy things but uh, when i have yeah i just yeah. bought a laptop for some reason what um how many computers have you got <laughs> well only one you don't what do you need a laptop for i i do actually need to separate the podcast from my gaming computer and the laptop is going to be used for the gaming obviously no, and the solely for computer. the podcast no is it yeah it's going to be i mean it doesn't require a graphics card although for some reason i bought a gaming computer laptop <laughs> Second hand, I hope. Um, there's no such thing. You don't buy shiny second hand stuff. 
But the, the important thing is, and I'll tell you why I did it. I've been thinking of it anyway, because with this computer that I use for gaming, I quite often wipe my hard drives and reinstall Windows to keep it running at 100% speed. So I clear any clutter and then reinstall all the programs I need. And I can't be doing that with all the audio files and finished episodes, etc. because I'd be gone forever. I can't believe it's anything to do with gaming. I think it's far more dodgy stuff that you want wiped off your computer. No, you know, every, was, while you're connected to the internet, every site you visit downloads cookies onto your computer so yeah, every time that. every time you visit a site it slows your computer down infinitesimally but over time it makes your computer into a steam engine really yeah. seriously yes because and it the needs thing is to be that they introduced that new law recently oh, a year or two ago where you have the option to choose which cookies you yes accept and have you se- have you seen those options they go no, on the, for pages and exactly. pages so and pages. everybody just clicks accept yes accept of course all. that's accept the whole all. idea that's what i do no but i mean you can there is usually another button here hidden away somewhere which says accept only essential and that's the one you should look for all right do we have any cookies i don't because i didn't get a chance to stop at ecomaxi on the way home (laughs) (laughs) do you have uh, do you have cookies on podcasts no No. uh well i don't know i say no but i guess some some of the more uh, i think probably um harry and meg's probably have cookies but then (laughs) they don't have a podcast well no they don't but they did get 20 million dollars from spotify to do a podcast did they yes 20 i think it was 20 it might even have been 40 it wasn't a podcast that was a documentary no 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 that was with netflix and they got 100 million dollars from netflix I'm talking about $20 million from Spotify to do a podcast series. They did one podcast totaling less than 20 minutes in the last 12 months. Now, by that reckoning, we should have been paid $100 million by Spotify to do five podcasts. You're not as attractive as Megan, though, Andy. You've got to accept that. I'm not a ginge either. Is he gin- he's got ginger hair, has he? Got Prince Harry. Yeah, of course he has. It's yeah, like right. saying, is Ed Sheeran a ginger? <laughs> You're right, the singer. I know who that is. Good. Ed Sheeran, I heard a description of him on another podcast I listened to, which was quite entertaining. And uh, they said that Ed Sheeran looks like your thumb after you've been eating a bag of (laughs) Watsits. Who, who listening to this is going to know what a Watsits is? Or do they have them in every country? Um, what are they called here? Those cheesy puffs? Those orange, chemically... Yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, they know. Whatever. If, if it's orange and crunchy, imagine your thumb after eating a bag of that. And that's Ed Sheeran, <laughs> that is. <laughs> Oh dear. So am I right in saying we did actually get to the conclusion of this do- conclusion no, of the Dr. Stop, Dix? Stop being what so do you mean? keen. He's, he's gone to prison and he died in prison. Yes, he died, but there's still well, a that's lingering usually the end. There's still a lingering mystery about this odd miscreant. He first appeared in the historical records in 1868, and that was while he was travelling through Europe, presenting himself as an aristocratic man of wealth. He came to New York in 1870, where he was caught stealing some pens and stationery (laughs) from a shop. Now, we all know that this man should not be allowed near pens and stationery. He then returned to Europe, where he served a brief term in London's Newgate prison for harassing a man in much the same way that he would later harass Dr. Dix. So he now, was a bit of an international traveller. He was an in international man of mystery. I mean, can you imagine the hassle going from country to country in those days? I mean, it's not as hard as it is today, obviously. Ten weeks, six weeks. How long did it take to cross the Atlantic? Uh, Three I weeks. No idea. If you went by a Titanic, it's <laughs> quite a interminable. Long time. <laughs> I can't remember what they were going for, the record. I have a feeling it was two weeks or something to get across the Atlantic. Oh, it must have been longer than that. I don't think so. We'll have to check it out. Yeah. I'll check it out. It's, um, yeah, nowadays with your, your COVID passport and your tests and your second day test and your eight day test. Well, you're lucky you joke about it. I've had to do it. Yeah. Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> 
Of course, if you were a member of the G7 summit, you wouldn't have had any such problems. No, that or a football supporter. Or a football supporter, yeah. Yes, you're right. Which just goes to show what a lie the whole thing is. We're not going down that road, Andy. Okay. Uh, how do you spell we'll we'll say that our politicians are not a bunch of lying, thieving Oh, that's fascists. got nothing to do with anything. I completely agree with that. I can't, I'm having difficulty spelling Atlantic. A-T-L-A-N-T-I-C. T-I-C. Atlantic crossing. Ship crossing. Crossing, crossing time cargo ship tro- well, no, uh, cargo ships better? would have taken six weeks at least no, because no, no, they no, go via the Suez days. Canal typical freighter ships take 10 to 20 days across the Atlantic today yeah but the ships weren't that slow but they're jet powered days. now I mean in those and days they were steam powered in 1880 yes what do you think they ran on they were still riding horses in the 1800s yeah you're right they were steam powered but uh, was Titanic when was that that was steam powered three big chimneys yeah, that's right yeah no you're right but they were pretty powerful I mean, they were pretty powerful bits of kit. Crossing time. All right, I'll add a date. 1880. I think you'll find the inflation on that time is a bit more impressive. Yeah. I'll tell you what, in 1952, someone did it fast. Three days and ten hours. That must have been a sailboat. You think a sailboat would have been faster than a steamboat? Absolutely. If it was um, a racing yacht. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Andy. I was right when I said two weeks. Uh, 1880, liner transatlantic crossing times in days. Uh, it used to take 18 days in 1833, and 1955, it got down to that three days. That's ridiculous. That three must, days. I mean, what what caused that 15-day difference? It must have been uh, what, diesel between engines. Between 1830, yeah, there must have been diesel engines in the 50s, and ships just got bigger, and the bigger a ship, the faster it goes. Is that true? Or did you just make that up? No, 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 that's true. The, the, the ratio of the length to the width of a boat determines uh, how fast it goes. OK, well, first of all, it's the beam. <laughs> <laughs> And the length is called... <laughs> That's a good question. I can't remember. I no, remember right. the beam. It's the length over the beam, or the beam-to-length ratio. Oh, anyway, where were we? Physics. Where were well, we? This been... fellow, I thought he was just a, some sad New Yorker, but it turns out he's an international Oh, traveler. that's right. He's an international man of fever and mystery. Uh, yes, he sets, yes, that's right. He spent some time in London prison. Uh, he returned to America then in 1875, where he briefly settled in Pittsburgh before returning to New York uh, and his famed good times with the rector of Trinity. And that's all we know for certain about him. William's source of income also remains unknown. He owned no property and had no bank account, although he apparently never worked a legitimate job, unless you count his ill-fated stint as a Sunday school teacher and he never committed more than a handful of petty crimes he always seemed to have lots of money and usually moved in high society his little swindles were evidently something he did merely for his own warped entertainment and not for financial gain he even published poetry and he produced a successful play although his literary glory was considerably dimmed when it was later discovered that these works were actually written and previously published by a new orleans nun God, fraud must have been so easy in those days. Oh, absolutely. 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 Dreamy because there was, easy. Because there was so much more business based on trust. Yeah. People writing out yes. checks. On, a letter. Yeah. If I give you a letter of intent, will you forward me £2,000? Oh. Of course I would. Make it three. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It must have been a, well, a gold mine for the con artists of the day. What is the term in America for con artists? A flim flam man? No. Uh, something else anyway but that's what these people obviously were a grifter thank you he sounds like a grifter this fellow I don't know because they can't find any evidence of him actually getting any money he did have a proper job at one stage he was a Sunday school teacher yes until they found him with his fingers in the choir boys (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so he did have a proper job. Anyway, he claimed he himself claimed to be connected to a wealthy and powerful Fairfax clan of Virginia, and that during the Civil War he fought ably for the Confederacy. And that's led to speculation that he was a remittance man, uh, the black sheep of a prominent family who paid him off to leave the country for his country's good. A uh, sort of sorry, a sort of Bertie Worcester from hell. Yeah, yeah. Maybe um, we shouldn't be so judgmental with me saying it was the baddies in the South. Yeah, because I mean the baddies in the South look at it the other way. <laughs>
Uh, no, you're yeah, right. No, no, no. But I mean, in, in modern times, the bad it was just, in the north. No, 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 no. But it, uh, in in modern times, obviously, you look upon uh, the southerners wanting to um, keep slavery. Exactly, keep slavery, and the northerners being against it. Then the obvious reaction is, as it should be, that the northerners were doing the right thing. Or do you have a view on that? That slavery? Well, in fact, you can't argue whether slavery should continue. It is continuing. Slavery so exists very much today. There are more slaves around today than there ever have been. Absolutely. Which is pretty shocking. Um, not shocking at all, really. It's just pretty shocking that nobody takes any notice of it. Well, yeah. No, well, I mean, they'll, they'll stand up for the rights of animals and uh, our alpaca that mustn't be fucking put down because it's what got TV. What happened to the alpaca? Well, it lost its court case. Yes. And DEPRA, is it? Yeah, or the DEFRA? Department oh, of uh, Environment and Protection of whatever um, it is. Have been given the right to kill it, but they, they just haven't turned up to kill it. It's, it's just comedy. It's a comedy oh. of errors. Oh. Did you hear that sound in the background? I heard. I that was, was ignoring it. That was my timer. And do you know what's ready? Your food. My laundry. Oh, my God. Your <laughs> life is just one big roller coaster of rock and roll <laughs> how sad are you <laughs> what do you mean i've just come from abroad i've got to catch up with the laundry <laughs> anyway According to some contemporary newspapers, the truth about him was a bit more prosaic. These reports claim that he was from a well-to-do and respectable Baltimore Cats. family. Hello, cat. Zena. Yeah, these reports claimed he was from a well-to-do and respectable Baltimore family who regarded him as always flighty. His sister, a Miss G.F. Bailey, thought vaguely that Eugene had made some money some years before in the book business. She said she didn't know the exact nature of the book business as he was... Very reticent on such matters. Well, we know he was a good writer. He, he obviously was. I mean, he, I, I would say that he was an author of some note. <laughs> or quite <laughs> or a few notes. 200 actually. of them, at least, that we know <laughs> of. Exactly, yeah. His mother was quoted as saying that her son was not sound mentally, but was so eccentric that he frequently seemed demented. <laughs> Oh dear. And that does bring us to the end of this week's strange well, thank story. Thank God, thank God for that is all I can say. Well, I mean, I hope it was entertaining to hear as it was entertaining to read. I, I, I sort of admired a man for his tenacity and his bullheadedness at just keep him coming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after after the... Uh, Smooth my balls. No, but after the solicitors and the bankers and the clothing merchants, I'd be running out of ideas. I, I tell you what, I'm surprised that uh, Father Rex was opening the door. I would have left the country. Well, I guess in those days, especially being a rector, you had to answer the door just in case it was a fallen woman in need of spiritual guidance. <laughs> or a fallen man. In need of a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I wonder what ever happened to Father Ricks. Dicks. Father Dicks. Yes, well, he's probably still alive. He he could have been up until recently. But anyway, as I say, that brings us to the end of good. this chapter. Yes, good job, Andy. Nice um, bit of research there. I hope everyone enjoyed it. If you did, join us again for the next episode. If you didn't, join us again for the next episode. You might like it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> you can find us on our Instagram at Strange Stuff Podcast. You can check out our website at strangestuffpodcast.com. And you can send us an email at strangestuffpodcast at gmail.com. Send us an email and tell us if there's something you'd like us to talk about or even if you'd like us to just get lost. Cat, and hang on a second, you forgot to mention Twitter. Oh, yeah, we're also on Twitter at Strange Stuff Podcast. Uh, we've got one follower so far. Be number two. <laughs> Is that right? I'm that. I'm probably the follower. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for joining us, yep. and we Cheers will see now. you again soon. Cheers. <laughs>